the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit in your life trains you to do that. What does that mean? It means that it trains you so that now the fruit of the Spirit is the produce of what he, in other words, it's what he produces in your life. So it is evidence that the Spirit is there. When you have the fruit of the Spirit, it's not just, oh, this fruit, that fruit, and think in these terms. No, it is that fruit that has grown in you that you exhibit. See, the Holy Spirit is trying to do in you exactly what the demon wants to do in you. He wants to do what? The Holy Spirit wants to live his life through you, just like the demon wants to live his life through you. The demon wants you to do evil, wicked, unrighteous things. The Holy Spirit wants you to do holy, righteous things. Amen? And so now his presence in you, by way of the word of God, put into your life and acted upon, will cause that fruit to grow, which proves the presence of the Spirit in your life. So one of the ways you can prove the presence of the Spirit is by the fruit of the Spirit that is produced in your life. But now, let's look at this. Now, go with me to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. We're not going to read all of the works of the flesh. We're going to talk about the fruit of the Spirit. Verse 22 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is, and the word fruit there is singular, Okay, the fruit, the singular fruit, okay, of the Spirit. Because you could have these individually counterfeited. But when you see all of them together, that's the fruit of the Spirit. Okay, it's like a diamond. A diamond has what, 56 facets, I think they say on it? And you can look at it through each one of those facets. Well, the fruit of the Spirit is one fruit. But depending on how you look at it, you'll see each of these manifestations of the Spirit. So, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. What does that mean? That means that you can demonstrate and exhibit any of these characteristics as much as you want all the time. There's no law against it. There's no law. You can't have too much peace. Amen? And people say, well, yeah, but you know that, that doesn't make sense. Why would there be a law against it? You have to remember, Paul is talking to the Galatians who were going back under the law, right? And he's saying, listen... The, the evidence of the spirit in your life is this, and you don't have to worry about violating the law because there's no law against this, right? So, and that word love is agape, which means a love you give without thinking about what you get back. It, you do it because it is in you to love, okay? Second, joy. Joy is not happiness, okay? You can have joy where happiness would not exist, and so there can be that joy in you that gives you that joy. Now, understand, joy, usually we think of joy and we think you look at a person and you think, well, if a person is full of joy, I can tell it. That's not always true, right? Now, understand, because you also, the next list here, or the next characteristic, is peace. And if joy, see, most people think joy is an emotion, or they think it they think it they think of it as an exhibition of an emotion and so they think joy is just bouncy and bubbly and it's all and yet peace is almost the exact opposite peace is quiet and calm and this and so these can't be opposites so they have to be there together so even the joy has to live in connection with peace you get that now the next one long suffering what does long suffering mean? Well, very simply, it means putting up with stuff a long time. That's literally, literally what it means, all right? It means that you put up with and put up with. Jesus said, how long 
must I suffer you? Long-suffering. Jesus was long-suffering. What is it? He said, how long have I got to deal with you? How long do I have to put up with you? And so he was talking about their carnality and how they didn't understand things. And yet, now notice, but notice, he was not long-suffering with sin. He was not long-suffering with religious ritual or religiosity. He was not long-suffering with the things... He, he, okay, he was not long-suffering. He, he went into, the, into Jerusalem and went to the temple and looked around. Then he came back out. Then the next day he goes back in and turns over the tables. So how long-suffering was that? Less than 24 hours, okay? So it wasn't a long-suffering like days and days and years and months and all that kind of stuff. You understand? So, but he was long-suffering. Now, notice... The next one, gentleness, gentleness in how you deal with people. But you can't say how you're thinking or how most people think of this. You can't say he was gentle with the Pharisees because he wasn't. He, matter of fact, he seemed pretty harsh with them. And yet, look how gentle he was with sinners. Isn't that something? So now notice the next one, goodness. Now, that word goodness, see, it's kind of funny because we look at gentleness and, and you say goodness, and sometimes it's hard to define goodness unless you look it up. But the word goodness literally means generosity. That's what it means. When it says in Acts chapter 10 and verse 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power, who went about doing good and healing all that oppressed the devil. The word good there, who went about being generous and doing what? Healing all that were oppressed the devil. How was he being generous? In giving away God's power. How was he being generous? Well, if you also, he was always giving to the poor. He was always feeding the hungry, even if he had to multiply bread to do it. So that was goodness. He was being generous in that sense. He was always willing to give out. Does that make sense? Now, and now notice, Jesus had the fruit of the Spirit also. Now, next one is faith. Then, obviously, faith is a fruit of the Spirit. There's a, now, notice, though, faith is the one gift, or one aspect here, that is mentioned both as a fruit. It's mentioned as a spiritual gift in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. There is the gift of faith. Here's the fruit of faith. And then we also know that faith as we have it to get saved, is the gift of God. Amen? So this is the one thing that is mentioned in all three categories, which is kind of strange because you would think love would be mentioned in all of it, but you notice there's no such thing as a spiritual gift of love in 1 Corinthians 12. But there is a fruit of love. Fruit is the proof of, of the spirit of his presence in your life. Amen? Now, he says, uh, verse 23, meekness, and then verse 23, the next one there is temperance. Now, the word temperance, I don't know why they didn't translate it better. Of course, they could have done that with a lot of different words, different places. But the word temperance, the best definition of the word temperance, let me give it to you. Uh, the word temperance is number 1466, Strong's Concordance. I always give you these so you can look them up and you can do studies with these, all right? It is the Greek word enkratia, enkratia. And it, well, the word kratos is a specific word for the power of God, okay? And it is a, in other words, it's a type of power that overwhelms and, and generally can't be resisted. But now notice, this is eg kratia, which means self-control. Self-control. Now think about this. If, if you don't, believe that your spirit and the Holy Spirit are melded into one, then this would make no sense. But he says here that the fruit of the spirit is self-control. Now, another way that is translated, and it's actually translated more, um, used more this way, it, is, it means the ability to govern yourself. Not just control, but to govern. See, when I say self-control, most people think hold back. Self-control means 
You know, I want to slap you, but I'm not going to do it. Right? That's not really the idea. Okay? The Holy Spirit, now think about it. The Holy Spirit doesn't give you self-control to keep you from slapping someone. Okay? Why? Because your nature should have been changed to where you don't want to slap someone. Do I need an altar call? Is that what we need to do? <laughs> okay, now, so, it, the, the term is better translated self-governing. Now, see, this is so foreign to most Christians because most Christians don't want to self-govern. They want all control to be given to God, and they want God to move them around like a puppet. That he just pulls their strings and they do this and, and they call that being led by the Spirit. But that is not what the Bible says. The, if, and again, if you're going to be led by the Spirit, then you don't need anything in the Bible to tell you how to live. But why would you need the Bible to tell you how to live? So you will know how to self-govern. Do you understand that? So the purpose of the Holy Spirit. Okay, let me ask you this before I say that. Do you think that Jesus, as he was walking around, that he had to be told moment by moment what to do or where to go? No. Why? But first off, it says he grew in stature and in wisdom. Why did he need wisdom if he was going to be led? So he grew in wisdom, which means in every situation he found himself, he knew how to govern himself to act in that situation. The, the fruit of the Spirit in your life will cause you to know how to govern yourself in every situation. In other words, you're not going to say, well, the Holy Spirit didn't tell me not to do it. No, that ain't going to work, right? Right? The Holy Spirit in you shows you, and the fruit of the Holy Spirit shows you how to govern yourself so that you know what to do and how to do in every situation. Amen? Now, this means, this, this is so foreign to most Christians and how they walk with God. Why? Because what I'm talking about here and what the Bible shows us is that we are to walk with God in oneness with him, in union with him, so that, and I've said it this way before, so that people can't tell where you stop and God, God starts. People ought to look at you whenever you say something and say, was that you or was that God talking? And you ought to answer, yes. Why? Because if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. So if it wasn't God speaking, you should have kept your mouth shut. Amen? Now, he goes on. Are, are y'all getting a hold of this? Yes. The Holy Spirit in you, will the fruit of his being in you, shows that you know how to govern yourself, how to self-govern. And again, people say, well, yeah, but the Holy, I want the Holy Spirit to govern me. No, 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 that's not his job. His job is to teach you, show you, remind you of what the Bible says about how you're supposed to live then it becomes a matter of your choice and a matter of your will to choose to bow your knee and bow your will to the will of God and therefore govern yourself according to the word of God. Amen? Now, it's, so technically this word, egratia, uh, number 1466, means as I said, it can, it's generally translated as self-control, but it is much better translated as the ability to govern oneself. And in that verse 24, and they that are Christ, belong to Christ, have crucified the flesh. Now notice, this is still talking about the fruit of the Spirit versus the works of the flesh. So they that are Christ, belong to Christ, have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Now watch, verse 25, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. You hear that? Now understand, he says if we live in the Spirit, we could say if we live by the Spirit, if we live in the, under the uh, 
auspices of the spirit being within us, within the realm of the spirit. It's not talking about these. Okay, when it says if we walk in the spirit, if we live in the spirit, it's talking about us being in the spirit of God. It's not talking about being in the spirit realm. Okay, so he says, because he said, if you have, if you are, um, if you belong to Christ, you've crucified the flesh. Okay. And he says, if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. So in other words, we are to be, if we live in the spirit now, because if we have the spirit of Christ in us, we are to live in the spirit. Our life comes from the spirit. Then we are also to walk in the spirit, meaning that we are to walk according to the spirit, meaning that our lives are in alignment with the spirit. It does not mean the spirit is whispering second by second what to do, when to do, or how to do it. It means that you walk through this world. Jesus, whenever he was preaching, they didn't like it. They took him out to the edge of a cliff. We're going to throw him over. And it said he walked all the way out there with them and then turned and walked through their midst. So he just said, nope, this is far enough, and turned and walked. Now, he was walking in the Spirit. He was walking according to the Spirit. Notice he didn't argue and fight and all this kind of stuff. He just walked along with them and then turned around and walked away. Amen? Amen? which is hard enough for most people to do anyway, is just turn around and walk away, all right? Now, 